ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Welcome back to Science Faction 27. God, we got 27 it's under amazing. our belt. That is that is quite the run. Seems like just yesterday. I mean, it's the longest time Damien's had a job. I think. Isn't there? Is it twenty seven well, or twenty eight <laughs> that uh, all those famous musicians died? Like Cobain and twenty seven. Twenty seven. Okay, right. so theoretically, we should all be murdered after this episode, right? Okay. Well, at least one of us. Yeah. And which one will it be? Will it be me, your host? <laughs> Archaeologist and comedian Robert Timothy, or the lovely and talented research scientist Jackie. Jeez, I hope it's not me. Or will it be the boisterous comedian without pants, Damien Mercado? It's clearly going to be me. I mean, it was always yeah. like in the doors. It was Jim. Moore. It was the rock star of the group. It was the most uh, badass. Plus, of if the group. we're going by yeah. horror movie rules, you are the blackest one among us. So, right, correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, also, Bobby and I have been planning to murder you. It's true. You get I figure we tell him now. Yeah. I mean, the part day of you the die. P- part of the plan is us telling you about the plan, and your yeah. reaction to us telling you about the plan is going to eventually cause your yeah. death. Just watch that. Is perfect. there anything I can do to prevent it? No. I mean, I'd like that's to- oh, part no. of the plan. Like, yeah. there's really nothing I. The can other do. part of the plan no. is me telling you that telling you is part of the plan, and the reaction to that information is actually also what will end up killing you. All right. Well, if I can't avoid it, is there anything I can do so that I perhaps enjoy this the most that I possibly can? Absolutely. You can listen to this week's science articles. Hell yeah. From molecules to particles, this is science article. All right, our first in this week's science articles is going to be one about free sex Tibet. Free sex in Tibet? Yeah. Or like free sexy Tibetans? No, free sex in Tibet quite a long time ago. How long do you think it would take to to get all the sexy Tibetans out of there? Like uh, the Miss Universe competition. 30 minutes maybe? (laughs) Have you ever been to Tibet? Me neither, but I see a lot of pictures of bald Well, I mean 30 minutes to fill one (laughs) helicopter worth of people. Yeah, that's it. Well, Tibet has the highest average elevation of any other region in the world. At 4,900 meters above sea level. So, 15, higher than Denver. Yeah, 15,000 yeah. feet, about three times higher than Denver. And there have been modern humans in Tibet for at least 21,000 years. And the ancestors of the current ones moved in about 3,000 years ago. Anyway, so Professor Nielsen uh, of UC Berkeley suggests that the Tibetan success of living at that high altitude is partially credited to the genes they picked up when their ancestors interbred with another extinct hominid, not Homo sapiens. Called the Denosivians. Denosivians? Denosovians. Denosovians. We called them Denny Bears in a previous episode. We're going to go with that from now on. <laughs> it's much easier to pronounce. So their ancestors mated with the Denny Bears, and the Denny Bears had a gene. And the gene was EPAS1, which is regulated by oxygen. And so what basically happens is this gene allows people to live in high elevations without their blood thickening, which is the normal right. reaction of the body to, to the high altitude. Oxygen. So this, this gene allows that to go on, and in doing so allows them to live up in high altitudes much more successfully and effectively with much less consequences to their body. All of these advantages, they come from another hominid one of their ancestors fucked 40,000 years ago. Amazing. Perhaps instead of Denny Bear, we should call them the Yeti because this is they interbred with an ape-like species who was wonderful at at better at, than the humans were at, at living up in those high altitudes. Oh. This is clearly the Yeti. I mean, perhaps okay, I get. I it. thought we established last week that it was a it was a it was, pizzly. Yeah, the legend was based on something. It was based on uh-huh. the, these hairy white apes Denisovians. that were clearly sexy enough to seduce or in rape. some way. Sexy enough to rape. Tibet, Definitely. Tibetans know a lot of kung fu. I, 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 First of all, not... sexy enough to rape was one of the worst children's series I've ever seen. <laughs> I don't know. It had its moments. Yeah. So basically, if you or I went up to high altitude, uh, because it's harder to get oxygen, there's less oxygen there and less air right. pressure. People temporarily compensate by thickening their blood. But that negatively affects your cardiovascular system for right. obvious reasons. Now you're pumping soup through your body instead of blood. How do you thicken your blood? Just add it. a little cream of tartar. Yeah. <laughs> Just whip it. You <laughs> take it out in a dialysis machine, whip it yeah. up real quick. And... Yeah. But the residents of Tibet, they're able to deal with that decreased oxygen permanently without doing that blood thickening. And this gene comes from them. So this is a really interesting case of you know modern Homo sapiens mating with another species, which, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean super primitive species we know almost nothing about the denny bears 
All we know about them is basically from a pinky that we found in a cave in Siberia. That's the only evidence we have of them. And then all the genetic traces we see later on in life. They must have been delicious. That all the remains were... That's right. Oh, just totally. Eaten. Yetis or Denny bears were clearly delicious. Yeti bears. Yeti bears? <laughs> so I for like all, both. I want to incorporate both. So for all we know, these looked very similar to Homo sapiens, and it wasn't that much of a stretch. But uh, we, they definitely did mate. Uh, in fact, the rare variation was found in 87% of Tibetans and only 9% of the nearby Han Chinese that don't that are not up in the high Not mountains. Anymore. Is the location sort of part of it? I mean, is there yeah. like an interbreeding sort of situation because of how high up they are? And not an interbreeding, a selective pressure. Those, pe- those people yeah. that carried the gene were, were much more successful at mm-hmm. both living and mating up there, and so it proliferated. It was probably taken from the Denny bears and spread throughout the population, that, which is why you see it in, in uh, 9% of the Han Chinese, but was selected for in those high-altitude Tibetans so that it concentrated. So anyway, uh, let's go on to the questions that this stunning article brings up. Question number one. Between Denny bears, Neanderthals, and recent evidence of a yet unknown third hominid contributor to our genome, our ancestors clearly mated with non-sapien hominids, in some cases resulting in a selective advantage in both Europe with Neanderthals and here in Tibet with the Denny bears. What animal would you sleep with to gain what ability for your hybrid offspring? Dolphin. I knew you were going to pick dolphin. What did you know I was going to pick dolphin? What? Yeah. what Clearly, uh, you're picking a psychic species. Then, <laughs> what ability would you get? What, what ability would your kids get when you mated with a dolphin? With dolphin, it's not just. I mean, first off, it gets me. It gives us a foothold into the seas. You know, climate change is going to affect the land. Okay. Let's let's expand where humans can go. We need a species that's that's well connected in the seas. One, two uh, knows we, all the right people. Knows all the right people plus echolocation. We, okay. Like, we are very sonar. ill-suited. We need the sonar. And three, prehensile penis. Yeah. This is a lot of traits you're passing on in one generation. You know, he might have convinced me. Dolphin sounds pretty good now. I like that. Now, let me ask you something. Are you doing the mating on land or in the water? Put it this way. Sometimes you feel like a top, and sometimes you don't. Yeah. If I'm feeling like a top, it's on land. I have more power there. Yeah. Uh-huh. If I'm feeling like the bottom, it's going to be, well, under the sea. Now, is it just going to be straight sex, or are you going to get a blowhole job? This situation will develop organically. I'm just not going to go straight to that sweet dolphin vagine just right yeah. off the bat. You know, I got, I'm going to have to, to smooth talk it. And who knows? Maybe it's a male dolphin who thinks that, that well, then, I'm then a then d- dolphin vagine. That wouldn't work if it was a male dolphin. You couldn't mate and produce well, offspring. I, I understand that. But, you know, sometimes you have to work your way into the, you know, like, for you example. You have a dolphin fluffer for your other dolphin sex. Listen, I need to work my way up to dolphin alpha if I'm going to get it. Like, listen, I could just sleep with any piece of dolphin tail if I wanted to. But I want I want the cheerleader. You hear uh, that, SeaWorld? <laughs> You can get any one of you. I want the captain of the cheerleading squad. That's right. Dolphin. That's like, right. So I'm going to, yeah, if I have to work my way up through the pod, I'm down for it. <laughs> Which, by the way, the captain of the cheerleading squad, Dolphin, was the dolphin from Sequest. All right, Jackie, uh, which animal would you sleep with for what advantages to your children? I I have a much simpler approach. Well, I also want to point out that it's a very different question for me than it is for Damien. Because for Damien, he gets to fuck an animal and, like, leave it alone. Me, I... So it's like an average day for Damien. Right. (laughs) For me, I have to get boned by a different species, carry the offspring, and then care for them. Yep. And complain about it. Jeez. Yeah. I'm just saying it. It's a lot more involved. It's clearly, it's going to be a well-hung species. We get it. Like, yeah. you're not going to take a mouse. Understood. <laughs> no, I was thinking I was thinking I would maybe like a cheetah. Okay. And pass along you know, speed because it's cool. Plus the outfit. Awesome. Okay. And also the metabolism. Because I think oh. in the long run, you know, with obesity rates what they are and diseases coming up left and right in kids, I think that uh, faster metabolism and... More athleticism and all that would would fare well for me. Also, if it was a girl and you really mistreated her growing up, she could have the ultimate irony of working at the strip club cheetahs. Oh, yes. Question number two. There might be enough DNA in the Siberian specimen to clone a Denny bear. If there is, should we do it and why? (laughs) <laughs> this would be a whole new hominid species. We don't know what its skeleton looks like. We don't know what its brain capacity is. We don't know what its tool usage is. Right. What should we do? We breed a football team that doesn't need to spend waste time doing cold weather, high altitude training. Oh, uh, yeah. They don't need to go to Denver for a year. They no, don't even need to better, go to they get, You do put them in Denver for a year, and they're fine with they it. They're dominate. completely appl- acclimated. They come <laughs> down here. Broncos. It's like they're wearing oxygen tanks everywhere. Okay, no. so just uh, just for sheer sports reasons. Well, like if, if if your goal is just to beat Denver, yeah, then 
by all means, clone them. Otherwise, I, I don't see the point. <laughs> Is there any other point? You hear made, that, Peyton? It's coming. <laughs> okay, Jackie, what about you? I mean, uh, for for the fruit of scientific knowledge, I think that, sure, we should clone it. Um I, I personally would like to see if it is bear-like because it would be nice for us to be right. I think. It's not. It's not. It's going to no, be hominid. No, like I'm picturing like the Grateful Dead bears where it's like colorful and they have like a tuft around their chest, but they don't actually, you know, they're like walking up and... Let me just translate what Jackie's trying to say. We should clone them if it turns out they got better tits than us. All right, on to the next article. Uh, you know me so well. Shocked to be left alone. <laughs> so a recent study, at least the headlines suggest that thinking is so excruciating for Americans that they'd rather be shocked than actually sit there and think quietly by themselves. So let's, let's, uh, <laughs> perfect. let's discuss uh, how this research went down. So the group took a large group, mostly undergrads, some student volunteers, and some community members to participate in quote-unquote thinking periods. Which, which sounds kind of like a punishment. God, I'm you so give a sick five-year-old. of thinking about my period. I wouldn't sign up for that in a second. Ah! <laughs> it's jolting, Jackie. <laughs> so the, what, the way these works is, is they last from 6 to 15 minutes, and they were in this bare room with basically no furniture, no nothing, no phone, no pen, and they were just No phone? To, no, nothing. How did you do that? <laughs> and they were just told for these periods to just think about something. They split them into two groups. One were told what to think about. Like, here, these are these subjects. You should think about this. The other one was just completely open. Just think about whatever you want. Sit there and think. At more than half of each group said it was an unpleasant experience, and they marked the reason. This is only 15 minutes? Yeah, 6 to 15. Okay. And they marked the reasoning for it being boredom. The researchers thought, well, maybe it has to do with these uh, enclosures. Maybe these aren't suitable for you know, thought. Let's let them do the experiment at home. They retried the same experiment at home. Same results. Mm-hmm. Most people didn't like it. Most people thought it was boring. They thought, well, let's see how far this goes. Let's see how bored they will get and what they will do when they're that bored. The participants had already reported being uh, almost twice as happy reading or listening to music than thinking. So they thought, I wonder what else they would rather do. So they put them in a room alone for 15 minutes <laughs> with a device. Yeah. yeah I was about to say, like, like, what percentage just unzipped? Yeah, just immediately exactly. started beating off. I can't stand it. Um, <laughs> they put them alone in, in the room with a device that was hooked up to them that could electrically shock them. That would give them electric shock. And they had the button to control it. Now, they weren't told to shock themselves. They weren't asked to. There was no reason to. In fact, in pre-research uh, interviews, Every single one of them said that they would have to be paid money to take an electric shock. But they're just sitting there for 15 minutes, and rather than sit there alone for 15 minutes, 67% of male participants <laughs> and 25% of female re- female participants immediately just started shocking themselves. Immediately? Not immediately. Oh, okay. Because yeah. um, I think that's, like, like, that like, says a lot more right there. Yeah, they got <laughs> jump on the buzzer and start. Okay, tell me go. Tell me go. Yeah, the door doesn't even close. They think they're playing Family Feud. <laughs> yeah. Um the researchers used that to say that basically people were so afraid of being bored that they'd rather suffer electric shocks than be bored. Now, are we talking like full on taser? Are we talking like, it doesn't actually say the voltage. I imagine it was a lower voltage probably than a taser. This would be hilarious to watch for the researchers. It takes a little bit of electricity to hurt. Electricity is not something that you need a lot of to really work in a recipe. What I got from the study so far, just given that a higher percentage of men, Yes. Uh, did this is that I think I now know why that virtually every explorer has been a man. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like we take those chances, you know. I, don't we'll look at me. I'm, the t- I'm one of the 25 percent of women who would totally do it. You say that, but uh, how do we know? I, how do we know you would? The, she got me. The study <laughs> also found that people who had more positive outlooks on their life were more likely to enjoy these thinking periods and actually appreciate them and want to do them more. One of the problems is when people feel like they can, they can get stuck in a negative feedback loop yeah. and just kind of keep taking themselves to worse and worse places. So sometimes that quiet time is actually good for you to sit down and think those things out. Did they restrict you from doing anything like besides masturbating? Like, were you allowed to close your eyes, lie down? Could you sort of meditate? I imagine you could lie down on the floor. There wouldn't be any furniture for you to lie down. But like, down see, on. they did it at your house. Yeah, interesting. I don't know what it is. I don't know what their their things were. What I was going to bring up for for our first question was kind of what Damien just alluded to, which is it really fear or boredom that's causing these people to voluntarily shock themselves? Could not this be just as easily seen as curiosity and inquiry rather than apathy and boredom? I feel like I would take the shock now, not out of a desire not to think, but just out of a curiosity about the shock, like yeah, how powerful it was exactly and everything. Because you know that it's safe. You're in the middle of a lab experiment. You're in a university. You know it's safe. Hey, 
fuck it. Let's see how this feels. You know, you only get so many experiences in life. Yeah. Let's check this one off the bucket list. Yeah. See, I, for me, I, I think there might, they might have a team of medics behind that door. It's, it's going to be a massive blast, and it's at a university, so there's usually a pretty good hospital attached to it. <laughs> You must be really familiar with IRB procedures, so that's yeah. exactly what would happen. Is this study really finding that Americans are bored easily and would rather hurt themselves, or is this actually one a study that's condemning the very inquisitiveness that's behind the nature of science? I think people saying they're bored is, is real, and I think that the article saying that people are bored is real. I don't know that I agree with the conclusion, just like you said. I think curiosity is a huge component. Yeah. And I think that it's not just curiosity of what's going to happen, but can I take it? Am I the kind of human being that can yeah. handle this kind of thing? I mean, there's all kinds of questions you could ask yourself. Like, I would sit there thinking about that button until I pushed it. Yeah. And I, and I, I wonder what the scenarios were that they gave them. I, I can tell you almost right now how this would go for me. About a minute after the guy left, I'd be like, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hit it real quick. I'm going to yeah. do it. And I'd be like, I wonder if I could hold that for two seconds. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm going to try this out. <laughs> One guy held it down for 14 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just shocking yourself nonstop. I think that'd be the way it works. Like, Damien, when you and I were in high school growing up, one of our friends acquired a taser, mm -hmm. right? And immediately, we needed to start tasing one another. Now, this was something that could happen to you involuntarily, but also the vast majority of the time, you volunteered because you wanted to figure out what that experience was. Right. And you want, or you wanted to break the record. I held yes. it for seven seconds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then we, we actually elaborated, got multiple tasers, and you would take two tasers at once and whatnot. You would smell icy hot on your groin yeah. and then take the tasers. <laughs> All for science. All for science. You're it's welcome. Remarkable you made it this far. Our kids don't have to do that because we did it. <laughs> yeah. If only we had recorded our results. Didn't have to repeat them every single night. Yeah. Well, we're publishing right now. I mean, this podcast will be published. That's right. <laughs> Public domain. Question number two. To play devil's advocate, instead of the first idea of this being the nature of science, the inquisitive nature of humankind, instead is this a sign of an overstimulated world? We always have some form of entertainment around us, whether music or phone or podcast or websites, all in the palm of our hands. Are we simply not comfortable being not entertained anymore? Yeah, I've also heard that that is actually a sign of intelligence. To constantly be. The ability to be alone and to think you know, to have sort of constructive thoughts to yourself without needing to be entertained, sure. yeah. you know, sort of, I, I can picture the people that I think could and the p people that I think can. And, and I think there might be something to that. Yeah. I kind of favor more the thinking of the last question than this one, you know, like where would we be? Like if there wasn't somebody out eating every plant, we wouldn't know which plants were poisonous or which ones were delicious. We needed those people, those, those first through the tunnel, mm -hmm. you know, the tip of the spear and everything, whether it's touching electric buttons the Shake, lab rats, if yeah. you will. G greeting the, uh, being the ambassador to the uh, saber-toothed tiger people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we needed these people yeah. to try so yeah. we could learn. They're, they're scientist heroes. No, but going back to what you were saying, Jackie, it is interesting if you think about it. If you think of the type of person who would be able to sit in a room for a long period of time just thinking to themselves and be happy. Yeah. The first people who couldn't do it, the people who would slough off in the first few minutes, are probably the really stupid people who don't have anything interesting to think about, right. who can't keep a cohesive narrative going, who get distracted easily, right? right? Then you would have the smart people who have a, some stuff to think about and some things that have been floating around in their heads they might want to work out and all that stuff. But then eventually they slough off too after a yeah. certain amount of time. And then you're just left with the even stupider people who are totally content staring at a wall. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. like it's an odd there's, catch twenty two. Yeah, there's there's like sort of a middle realm. Yeah, you don't want to be polls. you wanna be right in that sweet spot. If you yeah. get if you get out too early or too late, you're on the dumb side of the equation. Yeah. What are some things that would be going on in the head of like in the seconds before you push the button, in the stupid person who would push the button, not not the Forrest Gump who would just stare at the wall. <laughs> what are some things that would go through his head? Goddamn oh, Obama. Yeah, probably. Um, Ooh, a button. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be that bad. Only a pussy wouldn't push the button. Um, this might give me superpowers. I wonder if we'd be out in time for the Larry the Cable Guy show. This is just like that movie where the hot slut came out and we had sex in the lab room. Get her done. Paula Dean just came from a different time. <laughs> Since this is essentially a controller for life, i got to figure out how with only one button I can go up, up, down, down, left, left, right, right, A, B, A, B. <laughs> Imagine a guy after hits the button, you know, thinking, i got 30 lives. I can, I, I can jaywalk whenever I want. That's right. <laughs> okay, on to question number three. Interestingly, being alone with your thoughts is also the worst punishment our society can dish out in the form of solitary confinement because of the negative effects of lack of social contact. 
But quiet time to reflect is also the time you're most likely to be creative and productive. Balancing the two is probably one of the keys to happiness. In order to balance the, the quiet time and social connectiveness needed, can women agree to talk at least 15% less about unimportant bullshit like bathroom towel colors and marriage? Jackie, that one's for you. Just 15% less. Is that okay? I don't. Apologize? No. No. Apologize isn't the word. Apology accepted, Jackie. I'm horrified that someone I'm horrified who too. asserts that they, are, that they love and respect women oh, are you classifies. Really he loves and respect women enough for them to change, yeah. for them I, to help them to change. First of all, let me just I'm say. I'm offended as a woman who doesn't necessarily do that all the time. Jackie, I talk about plenty of bullshit. But bath towels is not one of them. Jackie, as somebody who loves and respects women, let me just say that I'm A, going to take that apology and accept it on behalf of all women. And B, <laughs> okay. thank you for agreeing to stop wasting our time with your worthless chitter chatter. <laughs> Fine. Here's why women talk 15% more. Here we go. Because you won't answer the fucking question just yes or no. It's always, uh, maybe, sure, huh, well. If you just were definitive and like, I like that, Wait, I don't like that. Here's, here's the problem. gauge that... our interest from just the response? They're all not interest. No, I need to but... navigate this field and jungle of Let me help you navigate. Let me help you navigate, because unfortunately you seem to have not gotten the translation. When you ask, <laughs> do you like this mauve towel? Would this fit appropriately in our bathroom set? And he says, uh, I don't know. You're taking it as, uh, I don't know. What he actually means is, shut the fuck up. I don't care about stupid shit like that. See, this is not, it's not even that. It's the. No, it's that. No, it's, no. Sure. it's that. No, it's, it's the, that. Uh, it's that. Sure. That's Check. what I don't like. Uh, sure. If, like, yes? Is that yes? Or is that no? Again, I, I can translate it again for you, but it's going to be the same translation. <laughs> Just okay, on to our last, uh, our last article. Our last one is about uh, the intersection of science and politics. Anybody who's seen a newspaper or a website in the last couple weeks has probably heard about the recent su Supreme Court ruling in America. My favorite part, too, is that most people in California I've spoken to about this are like, have you ever heard of this hobby lobby? Like, what yeah. is that? Like, we don't have that out here. Yeah, like, we have beaches, bitches. Nobody's yeah. fucking around Nobody with knows glitter the and the crafts. There's, is there a lobby group for the toy yeah. plane? <laughs> right. Basically, this is uh, was brought by a craft store called Hobby Lobby to all the way to the Supreme Court, and they were arguing that the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, had a mandate in there that uh, forced them to provide IUDs and Plan B contraception to women. And IEDs. Yeah, and, yeah that's right, improvised <laughs> explosive devices to bomb women. To be fair, I, I actually kind of agree with this part of the ruling, striking that's down right. the IED part. That's right. Yeah, well, it can get dangerous, um, especially if you mix it up with an IUD. So the reason they wanted this is because they claimed that the Plan B pill and the IUD are abortion measures. And the reason they're, they were saying these are abortion measures is because their definition of pregnancy is conception, is as soon as the, mm -hmm. the sperm meets the egg, whereas the scientific definition of pregnancy involves the egg actually implanting. They say the, the lack of the implantation is essentially abortion, even though scientifically you can't abort somebody that's not pregnant. Like that, well, that I, is a silly terminology. And the they, IED tampon is, is abortion. Yeah. That is. <laughs> well, the explosive tampon is one of the. Playtex discontinued that years ago. Yeah. There was such a backlog on them. There's a black market for those. <laughs> By the way, it's not like the shape charge tampon. It's the IED one. So it's made out of like a 9-volt battery and some gas primer. It's, it's, it's 100% extra, effective. Extra, I'll tell you. Yeah. extra large size. Yeah. It's just filled with ball bearings. It says on the box, you're not allowed to use these in public spaces. I don't know why people keep abusing these. <laughs> so what the ruling, Supreme Court essentially said was you we can't force them to provide these services because it's against the religion of the owners of the company and therefore against the religion essentially of the company so the company essentially has a religion now mm -hmm. well, and it's non you mean the right? inanimate I mean, objects yeah. right. no 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 they're a for-profit oh well, that and, doesn't sound and right that at all. yeah that huh. for-profit corporation apparently has a religion that religion has a completely false and mistaken view of pure biological facts, mm -hmm. and is using not only its mistaken view, but its religious beliefs about that mistaken view to take away the rights of its employees to certain health care coverage. Well, we don't want to err. We always err on the side of free speech. That's my philosophy. That's right. Jesus. 
So uh, one of the reasons this is bad is obviously it can limit the access of women to certain contraceptives. This particular ruling probably won't do it a whole lot just because it's so narrow and to a specific one, but they can use this ruling to expand yeah, that type sort of, of stuff. Gate, a gateway ruling. Which, which is what you will hear a lot coming on. Which, uh, by the way, also a bummer. The IUD is awesome. Yeah. the I, just awesome. The IUD is awesome. For those of you who don't know, it's an inner uterine device. It's like a little... T-shaped yeah, piece of either shape. plastic or copper that goes up into the uterus and it keeps you from getting pregnant. It's mm. incredibly effective. One of them prevents periods. That's right. Uh, they ha- it's like the pill where it has a supply of hormones as well. Yeah, some of them. You can have the IUDs with the hormones or without. The, the one he's talking about. Yeah, and uh, and they also take much less hormones because they're right in the uterus, so it doesn't exactly. have to go through the entire bloodstream. So very- and you don't run the risk of forgetting it. No, and it's, it's and it's completely effective as long as in there. Five as so, years. As soon as you're done, you don't want to. You want to start having kids. The doctor pops mm-hmm. it out, and I think it's only a few weeks before you can start. Technically, kids the again. next day you could get pregnant. Wow, it's like braces for your vagina. Um, I. You have how's to it like it, braces? You have to have it tightened. Like up it prevents you from getting laid, like braces. You and I go to very different porn <laughs> chat rooms. Yeah, that's right. So the downsides are what you would think. Those women have limited access to contraceptives, mm-hmm. which means that you're going to have more unintended pregnancies. That is always a bad thing, even if it doesn't affect a whole lot of women. Even in my opinion, one unplanned pregnancy is one too many. It's a silly yeah, thing agree. to focus. In doing so, they're also promote. They're going to cause more abortions. Uh, so congratulations, Hobby Lobby. Yeah, well done. Yeah. But there is something that has been left out a lot of the major media coverage when it comes to this case. Yes, that is a tragedy that that is taking contraceptive availability away from women. That is disgusting, and and it should be something that we draw attention to. Yes, it's also disgusting that that what they're saying, that corporations somehow can have religions. That is completely nuts and a Mm -hmm. a weird concept, because I'm not sure how a corporation can believe in something. Well, they're people. But, yeah, of course, it, it is because they're people. But there's something that's even further, which is that they've redefined the level of evidence argued for statutes at the Supreme Court level to instead of being based on the world as we know it, as is reflected as best we can tell by scientific fact, to now you can argue this is what my ancient beliefs tell me through divine revelation. And that gets brought in with the same weight as the scientists saying, no, this is not a pregnancy. This is not a pregnancy. They're not pregnant. But them going, well, some crazy line of religious reasoning that we have says they are. And so, therefore, our opinions are just as valid. Yeah. I Welcome s- to America. <laughs> I seem to recall the opening court scene of Devil's Advocate yeah. where he defended uh, a man who was sacrificing animals as part of his religion, got him off because that was his belief. And he believed it made people healthier. We are the nation founded by all the people who said, hey, everything happening in Europe right now, not religious enough. Let's go found our own <laughs> our own puritanical state. I'm horrified as a woman because this targets this only targets women. You know, it's not targets restricting. Men too. I know, but like but it, you you can buy a condom. You know, whereas the girl you may have knocked up last night, all the kids you didn't. All the kids I the have, B. all the kids I've have, I have yelled at their mother, get the fucking abortion, and they refused <laughs> because of them. This affects me too. Do I? You. You're I right. have to move right. states every year because of these fucking kids. I'm sorry. I forgot about your situation. Did you? And I didn't mean to offend you, but I just mean it's it's sort of remarkable that that's okay. And then, you know, not to mention this whole corporation religious thing. Like, I just can't even, like, how do you even do that? Well, that, and then these are, they're not abortion measures. So Plan B right, yeah. and uh, the IUD, they prevent, sometimes imp- prevent the implantation of fertilized eggs, for the most part, just prevent the implantation of non-fertilized eggs so that they right. continue down the cycle and, and go out. These are not abortion measures by any means, and, and no legitimate scientist would call them that. And their argument that they are is fallacious, so it should be thrown out on that particular merit. It would be as arbitrary and dangerous as somebody coming up and saying, hey, we need to redate like Stonehenge or let's say something older, Chattel we need to, we need to make We need to pass a congressional bill redating Chattel because it says it's 12,000 years old. And the Bible says the earth is 6,000 years old. Therefore, we need to, to yeah. redate that. It's, it's as it's silly. Insane. Yeah, it is as it's baseless insane. and silly as that. But the Hobby Lobby also kind of has us by the balls. They know that we are not going to boycott them because Joanne Fabrics is a bunch of Holocaust deniers. That's right. 
And by the way, to uh, to anybody who believes that simply not implanting a fertilized egg is the equivalent of abortion, naturally, without anything done to it, 60 to 80 percent of fertilized eggs don't get implanted by nature. So it turns out God causes a fuckload of abortions, more abortions than he causes babies being born. So yeah. God loves abortions, if you're right. Yes. It's his favorite thing. He That's... loves abortions more than children, if that's what you believe. That's what they should put on the box of Plan B. Please God let loves the... abortions. <laughs> Please res- let that last fucking response by your Bobby result in the world's best fan mail. Please. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. God. God loves abortions more than babies under your logic. Just take it. Take it as you will. Up the ass, Hobby Lobby. Listen, the, the, the real problem is this. I hate the idea of anybody being forced to have kids that they don't want. Society benefits when only one, per- only the person who want to become parents become them. In that who sense, can become who are capable. And- yeah, and in that sense, I disagree with you, Jackie. Because I do, want I do to, think, like Octomom. I do think it disproportionately affects women, but I think it affects society as a whole. Anytime you force anybody, woman or man, to raise yeah, yeah, and, and have a child that they don't want, and access to contraceptives decreases the need for abortion. So you're going to be causing more abortions with this. Mm-hmm. And lastly, family planning is one of the most effective and reliable ways to move up economic class. Yeah. If you are lower class and you want to be upper class, the two things you can do that will make that happen are education and family planning. And if you fuck up either one of those, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. You can be really well educated and make a decent money, but if you have 10 kids, you're going to be broke and so are they. Yeah. Do you think the church like is thinking, this was only phase one of the plan? Phase two, we are going to put, instead of Planned Parenthoods, rhythm method clinics out there that, that get <laughs> yeah. the message out there that just telling your body that we can only have sex during certain times... Where does this leave us with other things? You know, we talked about do certain forms of Muslim groups who believe women shouldn't vote or pay taxes or participate in civil economy. Do, should they have to pay half as many taxes because their women shouldn't go to school? And it's against their religion to pay for women to go to school or to use the roads or to use civil services. Should they have to pay half the taxes because they should only have to support the male side of that? Yeah. Or, or you know, if you go to college and you pay tuition and you don't believe in half of or more than half of the classes given like yeah. do you do you not have to pay for those if you don't like the dorm you're in you don't believe that it's can you right... justify it religiously then yes yeah. absolutely but do you see what i mean like, yeah you can justify just... anything right yeah i mean it's cause... all based on belief and not facts which is what this is all about yeah and clearly in this case even their belief are we have a religious belief against abortion okay that's not abortion well we also have a religious belief that this is abortion you're just defining things into existence at that yeah. point yeah Damien, this uh, this is a question for you. Interestingly, all of the women on the Supreme Court voted against the measure. So, Damien, why are men trying to ruin our country and constitution by legislating based on religion? Yeah. Listen, ladies, I am not against change. I'm just saying let's do it slowly. Like, for example, we have three women on the Supreme Court. How many were there 30 years ago, 50 years ago? All right. Eventually, there'll be five of you, and then you'll be allowed to walk on your own. You'll be allowed. You won't need men to tell you how to live your life and and what to do with your bodies. But right now, we're not there as a country yet. (laughs) And listen, we got three justices. You're represented on some cases. I mean, someone like the way you looked at me while you explained that story just now. Listen, you can take your IUD IUD out when you and your significant other bring a case to me (laughs) that you're ready. I'm just not ready to make that commitment. No, I now, want can, to keep my IUD in. That's the problem. Now, can Jackie Listen. do that? Can Jackie come to you herself, or does she need permission from her boyfriend and or father? Listen, if she can come with a written note, I'll accept it at their word. They're both honorable That's fair. Men. That's a fair way to handle things. Listen, I, what Jackie, about my corporation? Do you have, uh, oh, well, that can do whatever it wants. Oh, okay. That's not a woman. That cor- okay. Technically, there, corporations have penises. No, I mean, do I have know. to ask my corporation? Okay. Well, I mean, they're people unlike you, so yes, you right. would have okay. to. Okay, you're right. <laughs> I've totally forgotten that. Question number three. What's really interesting to me about this is that before the Affordable Care Act, Hobby Lobby was providing these services, IUDs That's and Plan my B. favorite part of this whole thing. With no problem. No they, problem. Before ACA, they didn't care that they were doing this. But then once it passed, they brought this big lawsuit, which makes this look more like politically motivated issue rather than a religiously motivated one. Additionally, Hobby Lobby's investment portfolio includes the exact companies that are making these contraceptives. Yeah, so clearly, the companies that make money. So clearly, they didn't care enough about their religion as long as it was making them money. Mm-hmm. And considering lessening access to birth control will increase the amount of abortions had by Hobby Lobby employees, it seems like Hobby Lobby has a lot of contradictions in its policy. If we're going to start legislating based on religious reasoning, 
Should it now become the job of the court to investigate and substantiate specific lines of religious reasoning? Should the court rule on the validity of the Trinity of, or the divinity of Jesus? How can the court allow religious exemptions without some way to substantiate a legitimate religious exemption and therefore a legitimate religion? If my beliefs are completely pacifist, can I just not pay taxes for war if that's part of my religion? We need to start a religion to start getting all of these special treatments. Mm, good point. If we did that, what would our religion be called? What would its tenets be? And what special exemptions would we ask for from the government? I feel like we need to have Festivus in there. I feel okay. like it's important. <laughs> That'd be our, our Christmas. The, okay. ear, the earring of grievances is a particularly good point of it. So, And a guy comes in dressed as Krampus. Krampus is Krampus. going to be our Santa yeah. Claus. The punishing of bad children. Absolutely. Yeah, not so much stuff for good kids, but just the punishing of the bad kids. Well, no, no, no. The good kids get presents Christmas morning. The, the bad kids get Festivus morning. brutally punished in front of them the night before. <laughs> Listen, there's a male figure that comes in, and if in, in certain neighborhoods where there aren't a lot of them, a police officer comes in dressed as Krampus and has like a switch and just yeah. beats the kid for like yeah. five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I like this. It's um, got to be embarrassing, though. Like he should – you know what would be funnier – is if he took every kid that did something wrong, stood them up on a stage in front of their entire class and friends, and detailed the embarrassing things that had happened to them throughout totally the year. Like, the... On May 4th, Jeremy pissed himself while in gym class. Nobody really noticed he got away with it, but uh, he's kind of a dick, so we're telling you now. <laughs> There'd be a sharp increase in the amount of students who got good grades and behaved and listened to their parents, and also a sharp increase in serial killers, because there are going to be a certain amount of kids who this will traumatize, and they will just... <laughs> Be like you'll Ted Kaczynski them. Yeah, like but then, but at least they won't start killing people till they're after eighteen because they don't want to be standing up there in their senior year and have them yeah. go. He murdered a bunch of people. Well, it was... <laughs> I think uh, our tenant our tenant should be always going on the evidence, not being afraid to fuck another hominid species if it looks enough like us and can confer genetic advantage. Oh, see, I, I thought for a second you were going to describe science. Yeah, but and now we're uh, past that. And uh, taffy, you gotta love some taffy. And there's a secret handshake. Uh, oh, totally. It resembles a hand job, but it is a very <laughs> secret handshake that only... What's our religion called? Uh, oh, we have to figure out a name. We'll just call it... How about just better? Okay, better. Better. All right, well, <laughs> the secret handshake is essentially a hand job for better. Uh-huh. Okay. And that's okay. how you know. And by the way, when you go to a truck stop, a lot of people follow the better religion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inside gay right. bars, tons of people follow this religion. By the way, also, a very long greeting process. Because a handshake, typically only a few seconds. Yeah. Hand job, long time. But if you practice enough... Well, can... are you going to completion, or is this just like a fluff Oh, job? it's still completion, so, absolutely. Okay, like, wow. that's how you know, that's how you know they're a, committed to science. I don't know about This could that. be a 10-minute greeting. Yeah. Well, especially, Ten minutes. especially when you're meeting ladies, and you're just like, you know what, like, well, I'm sorry, do you want me to light candles? What the fuck? Like, yeah. Yeah. you can fake it. If, like, you, like, this can end on you, if you want. <laughs> And that is why the betters, of course, have historically always worn those old-time overalls with the trap back door, but they wore them backwards. Yeah. We should probably get, like, hoods, like white hoods. Okay. You know, so we stand out. With and like, and we don't with like... two S's intersecting. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that, and then we're obviously we're for reason-based evidence, so we don't like Christianity, so we should burn giant crosses. Yeah, yeah, like in, like in uh, you know, I don't know, front yards. Yeah. And then since, you know, like a lot of inner city youth are, are really kind of disenfranchised, I feel, by the system, we can spread our message there with these crosses. It's like, hey, you know, stop going to church. Let's take some science classes. We're here to teach. We got a we yeah. science van out back. Totally. Oh, my gosh. And to help integrate biology to it, we could dress horses up the same way and ride them through the area. All right. Let's move on to science fighters. <laughs> Too far. Science, science fighters. fighters. And science fighters. Which side are you on? It's a little confusing, I know. It's a double entendre. You know what? Just listen. You'll, you'll like it. All right. In this week's Science Fighter, we have uh, the, the finale to a story we have followed since its inception. Mm -hmm. Our Science Fighter this time, fighting science, our old friend, Haruko Abakata. Female biological researcher in japan i'm glad that we finally have a name because we just were being really racist against the japanese like yeah. for a lot, our, our rage yeah. was unfocused that's right now we know exactly now. where to go yeah. she was only 30 years old she was a promising researcher in japan 
she came out with this research paper that said that you could essentially create stem cells by roughing them up. We covered it when the f- story first broke. Mm-hmm. Her research said an acid bath. if you dipped it in acid or squeezed them to the point of almost killing them, you can turn very young cells, from, uh, especially from babies, into stem cells. The news was met with great acclaim because this would be huge. Immediately, other research institutions began trying to recreate the results. Hell yeah. First thing that happened, they were having trouble doing it. We reported on that when it first Mm -hmm. came out. They were having trouble, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. That's just trouble recreating data. Then more stuff started to trickle out, including the fact that they think that the head researcher had faked some of the photos in the actual paper. One of the research uh, paper's authors took his name off the paper. That's a big sign. Something's going wrong. Big sign. We covered that when that happened. And lastly, now... They are actually retracting the paper completely, the researchers themselves, saying that indeed they do not believe the findings to be legitimate, they can't Mm -hmm. trust them, and they believe fraud, direct fraud, is the cause. This is a big deal in science, guys. When this happens, it's very big. Sometimes it can can lead to criminal charges, depending on what country you're from. A journal retraction from a major journal like this is very rare. They've actually kept it available online so you can go check it out, even though the paper itself is retracted because they want to make sure people can kind of look at it. Yeah. Buzz for the journal. So the head researcher in this case faked some of the pictures. In fact, she used some of the ones from her own dissertation, which is... (laughs) Yeah, that's my favorite part. Just poor form. Just use the ones you haven't (laughs) published at least. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to commit, go all the way. Yeah. Or just draw a mustache on the ones that you've already published. You know, you just get in there with a little Sharpie. You're like, they won't notice them now. (laughs) So essentially, we've covered this from, you know, we covered it from the start. We yeah. covered uh, when the findings were uh, first suspected to be suspicious. And we're covering it now, now that the paper is being retracted. We took her down. Yeah. We gave her the Jenny McCarthy treatment, who, by the way, yeah. also That's was right. fired from her job. We are taking down yeah. Dr. Oz. You're next. Yeah. Hell yeah. You're on the list. Who do we, do we go after Oz or Chopra first? Oz. Oz. Okay. Oz. He's already in the crosshairs. We'll come yeah. back. All we'll right. circle around. Oz, you've got it, man. First, it was you had to deal with Congress. That was nothing. Now you have to deal with us. So along with retracting the paper, the researchers also cited five more errors previously undisclosed that they had located within the paper. Importantly, again, like we've talked about last time, this is how science works. This is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, A similar thing happened to Andrew Wakefield, the British ex-doctor who committed academic fraud to promote that whole vaccine causes autism idea. Oh, was she silenced too, just like him? That's right. And he did it for financial gain. He was being paid by and owned a share of an alternative inoculation company, and they were trying to commit fraud in order to get people to switch use of one vaccine for another. There are mistakes But that's why there are so many safeguards in place to correct them. In this case, the paper got to the last of those safeguards, which would be replication by a separate source, and it got shut the fuck down. So hurrah for science and the advancement of truth over untruth, even if that untruth is being preached by a respected scientist. So uh, that's the way it works. I thought it was an excellent example of science fighters. We had somebody go all the way from a science fighter to a science fighter. Kind of surprised the Supreme Court didn't make the science fighter list. Yeah, I mean, I suppose they could have. Yeah, that's true. I feel like they always could have. Yeah, that's totally true. I mean, there's a lot of things like that. Like, all of a sudden, you might have a lightning round. Oh, man. Oh, he sneaks up on you. Uh, nowhere. You just never know. You keep trying to get one by me. I'm not. Just, I'm quick. No, he's, he's going. Good. Lightning round question number one. What everyday substance can you use to produce x-rays? Sweat. Oh, you sweat a lot, and the sweat makes x-rays. That would be really yeah, hard if you... Yeah, because it amplifies just, like, the ra- their natural radiation. That would be hard if you w- were in a hot room getting x-rays, because then you would be shooting x-rays out and disturbing yeah. the x-ray film. Yeah, you, you got to get all those heavy vests. Okay. Damien? The contents of your car. But there's a catch. Only MacGyver can do it. So he puts together the contents of your car in order to create x-rays. Yes, or the contents of this room. He will work with what he has. To okay, get what everyday substance is all over the inside of your car? Plutonium. Thought I had him. Oh, Thought you, he was going to complain. Yeah, you were going to go with the semen joke. But he was actually being honest because he's been blowing a lot of irradiated scientists. <sighs> yeah. Chernobyl hey, scientists need hey, places to... to shame like, on me. Yeah. Shame on me. Regular prostitutes turn them down. Well, you know what? I won't. <laughs> I yeah. blow the veteran with the sign on the side of the highway, and I'll blow the Chernobyl scientist. <laughs> I'm a hero. The actual answer to what everyday object you can use to create x-rays and to actually take an x-ray, scotch tape. 
Hey! I know. This is actually research that was done in... Now, is it o- just scotch or just any kind of That's adhesive right. tape? By it, Professor MacGyver? Research that was published in 2008, uh, but it's making the rounds again now, um, which is that in a vacuum, if you unzip scotch tape, it will actually release x-rays. And to show the effect of this... In like o- just pull it off the roll? Yeah. Oh, okay. To show the effect of this in 2008, they did this in a vacuum with uh, little dental x-ray plates, and they used scotch tape to x-ray a guy's finger. And uh, cool. you can, if you create a vacuum and do this, you can literally do this at home Did with dental x-ray plates. what the active ingredient that does it is? Well, it has to do with the, the, the sticky substance. As they're pulling it apart, there's some stuff going on where you're actually creating energy that comes uh-huh. out. And in fact, if you're not in a vacuum and you want to see this effect yourself, go into a dark closet, take a thing of scotch tape and unzip it. And what you'll, you, it won't produce x-rays because you're not in a vacuum, but it will produce photons and it'll glow. No shit. Yeah. So I'm this doing is some that science. When I get home, this is some science you can do uh, at your own house. Really interesting history to this too, because in 1953, Russian scientists reported the phenomenon of Scotch tape being able to admit uh. X-rays. But I guess like they we just all built a bunker to get got rid of all the Scotch tape. No, but we all just thought that they were drunk Russians and ignored them <laughs> until 2007. Like nobody even looked into it. They're like, "Well, fuck that. Those guys. They don't know what they're talking about." Uh. And so they, we didn't do anything until... Ruskies, am I right? Until 2007 where they did it and they found out that it, that it worked and they, uh, now it's all over YouTube and you can find videos of people doing it. Yeah, after this episode's released, there's going to be a ton of people who are pissed off that they can't find any tape in their house anymore. Yeah. yeah. You guys are watching that video and doing the, the experiment again. You can't we have to move. <laughs> we need the tape. You can do the same thing with the peppermint lifesavers as well. Question number two, what machine has one scientific crusader fought against despite such opposition being a threat to their own lives in the new Egyptian regime? That sperm expra- extractor we were just talking about. Oh, the Egyptians don't want them to they get a hold of the Chinese that. sperm extractor. What are they That's afraid right. of? That they won't have sperm coming out. <laughs> it's, it's hard to get somebody <laughs> to kneel and pray to Allah when they can stand and get blown. Yeah. Very few guys would be blowing themselves up for virgins if they just had a fuck machine right there. But that was oh. adding on. Damien, what machine has one scientific crusader fought against despite such opposition being a threat to their own lives in the new Egyptian regime? President Al Sisi's political machine, probably, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Actually, it is miracle devices that the Egyptian military is using to treat people with viral infections. In M- fact, miracle machines. Yes, these are machines that can cure your body of viruses without even touching you. We reported on, this, on these machines. I don't know if we did these ones specifically, um, but there's a lot of these going around the Middle East right now. There's uh, fake bomb detectors that are essentially divining rods, things like that. And in this case, the military is promoting them. The military is in control in Egypt. They're handing down sentences of up to seven years to journalists who speak out against it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a serious deal. But this one guy, this one Egyptian scientist, Islam Hussein, by the way, worst name for a Midwestern politician ever. (laughs) Jesus. Islam Hussein uh, is a scientist who has 80-minute PowerPoint lectures, 80-minute PowerPoint lectures on YouTube, and they're wildly popular in Egypt. And it's gotten so popular that the Egyptian military has actually delayed these machines from coming out and coming into service pretty soon so he he could have been on science fighters as well had it not been for the uh the stem cell paper which i really wanted to highlight he would have been on our science fighter list mm. islam hussein so wait, th- these machines are actually being there's an assembly line where people are putting together yeah, like, sure yeah. how does this machine supposed to work, well, supposedly work the, the same way the their old bomb detector one did it was just kind of like an old school lie detector it was a circuit that would give one answer or another based on environmental conditions of the barometer or whatnot that had nothing to do with whether or not there was a bomb there right and it would make noises and they go oh well no bomb go ahead <laughs> yeah exactly is it okay this is this is a box what you're gonna do is you're gonna hook up this electrode okay you're gonna drink plenty of liquids for the next four days you're gonna sleep a lot you're gonna make sure you get plenty of rest and then before you know it this machine will have created you from your viral infection Question number three, what fundamental constant of the universe do scientists think we may be wrong about? Death and taxes. Ooh, both of those. Two. Duble. Yeah, eat that, Franklin, you fuckhead. (laughs) You don't know what you're talking about. Mm. Why don't you go fly another kite in the lightning storm? Lightning round storm. (laughs) Uh, We're starting to find out that we may be wrong about American exceptionalism, that America may not be number one. What? What? Listen, these are, these are British scientists. These okay. are not American scientists. 
How dare you? This is published in the Lancet. July 7th, too? Just three days after Independence Day? They actually the movie. Found... <laughs> it, it aired on Friday. I don't know if you guys saw it. It's the actual classic. constant of the universe that scientists think we may be wrong about? The speed of light. So uh, faster? Uh, no, they think it might go slower periodically throughout time. Let me explain how this works. Uh, this is based on astronomical observations of the brightest and closest supernova that's happened in the last 400 years, which occurred in 1987. You could actually see it with the naked eye. Astrophysics tells us that as a star explodes in what's called a supernova, it emits neutrinos, which only somewhat interact with regular matter. So they basically just pass through everything. They can pass through the entire Earth with no problems whatsoever. And because they do that, they're not affected by stuff getting in their way. So they, they go away at the speed of light without any impedance. Now, we've always known from astronomical models that that means we should get a burst of neutrinos and then approximately three hours later, I mean, it, it'll depend on how the distance from our planet, but in this star's case, approximately three hours later, we should see the light. What happened was we got two bursts, one seven hours and one four and a half hours oh, before, one star burst. before we saw the light. Which doesn't make any sense because some models do say there should be two collapses and there you can have two bursts of neutrinos, but you should still it should still only be three hours between the first neutrino blast and when we see the light. In this case, it was seven and a half. Well, there is one professor who has an idea of why this is. One of his ideas is that photons of light, as they're traveling, they split into one electron and one positron. This is a known phenomenon, mm. and then it comes back. They, so it splits into uh, one positron, one electron, then it goes back into a photon. While this is happening, even though those particles all travel at the speed of light, there's a delay. And uh, that delay, he believes, is responsible for it over a significant long distance, in this case, 163,000 light years. He thinks that delay added up to enough to cause that four-hour difference between when we should have seen the light and when we finally did. Very interesting idea. It relies on something called vacuum polarization, which is the established concept that photons can turn into a positron and an electron suddenly and then turn back into a, a photon. He thinks gravity fields might affect these a lot, and therefore as these things came through the center of the galaxy where we have large gravitational objects, it's possible that they were strategically affected in such a way that they would take longer to get to us, and he believes that the mathematics works out to the point where it explains the exact time difference. So maybe the speed of light, not so fast. Yeah, but neutrinos sounds like a great marketing plan for Totino's pizza rolls. You know, That's to right. make it healthier. Yeah. So is light speed now attainable? Never. Well, maybe not by you, but by me. Like, could I do it? Nope. He's pretty fast. Ooh, but what about when I mate with the cheetahs? Even then. Damn it. In order to... You need a lot of cheetahs. Theoretically, to, to get... Ah, they're all cheetahs. The Am I right, ladies? <laughs> Relativity is so weird, and the math is so weird behind it, that as you accelerate an object toward the speed of light, it actually gets bigger and bigger the faster it goes. And mathematically, to get an object to the speed of light, it would become the size of the entire universe. Also, it takes more and more energy to go faster and faster, and it would actually take an infinite amount of energy to speed any amount of matter to the speed of light. So, no, unfortunately not. All right. Okay, let's move on to our last segment, Finish My Story. Finish My Story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. All right, gentlemen, the score is 7 to 5. 7 to 5. In favor of Mr. Timothy. Indeed. This is your round, Damien. I like to fight from the bottom. That's why okay. they call me the power bottom. Oh, well, that might work in this, in this scenario. He is referred to that on most bathroom stall doors. Huh. Internet websites, chat rooms. Yeah. That's where I saw your picture recently. Okay. So I was surfing the web, and I was thinking about, you know, arsenic and arsenic poisoning because I think we maybe have even brought up on the show, but arsenic poisoning is sort of a, a hot button issue. You know, <laughs> now they're finding that low levels of arsenic can can have detrimental effects, and that a lot of the foods we eat have mm. a little bit of arsenic. You know, like Brussels sprouts and um, some other leafy greens. But what's interesting is they're now thinking of ways to test arsenic poisoning, not just in adult humans, but also in growing fetuses. Mm. And I was wondering how you guys think they test for arsenic poisoning or levels of arsenic in developing fetuses. In developing ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, live. Okay. Well, okay. I believe, I mean, the standard procedure is to use a porn star-based penis amniocentesis in which a okay. porn star with a long penis penetrates a woman to the point where their penis punctures the fetus's skin. A small amount of it is kept within the urethra, mm -hmm. then pulled out, and they use that for testing to determine whether or not the baby has any defects, genetic or environmental. Okay. Okay. 
penile amniocentesis. Okay. What about you, Damien? Well, women, I mean, we all come from eggs, right? Right. Well, eggs that are high in arsenic, if you spin them. So if we were to place a, uh, like a pregnant woman on her back and just spin her violently, uh-huh. when we looked at the fetus, if the fetus's brain wound up in a uh, scrambled form, then we knew the baby had arsenic poisoning. If not, then... <laughs> You mean like a hard-boiled egg, like how it won't spin? Yeah, exactly. Babies okay. with arsenic poison are very resistant to spinning, and it's a, a centrifugal force. Okay. Okay. All right. You know, there, there might be other creative ways, too. Like, for instance, if you come into a house that has a mouse problem, the first thing you're supposed to do is not put out a mouse trap, but to put out a variety of food, like on little plates, to see what the mouse prefers. So you put out a plate of peanut butter and one of cheese and maybe one of raisins or something, and whatever he likes the most, you then put out again. It's used to eating from you. It'll go right to it, right? Similar idea. You just take a little bit of arsenic and you put it right through the portal, right through the door of the woman's vagina. Mm -hmm. And then if you come back two days later and the baby's taken it, you know (laughs) that he loves arsenic. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Um, n- neither of you are correct, by the way. Well, there's a what? Stu- <laughs> Scientific. No, that's just because they have not done my experiment yet. Yeah. Well, there's a study. Maybe with cheese they have. I yeah. don't know. I don't Do, know. But wait, not- hold on. Wait. Google arsenic in the vagina. See if maybe you've overlooked yeah. something. That's fi- That's fair. I don't know if you know, but in uh, less developed countries, children who are more uh, more fussy, yeah. finicky, they cry a lot more, have higher survival rates. They let the mother know, right? Oh, really? Right. Okay. Uh, arsenic is the active ingredient that that child is, is fiending for. It's, ah. it's what they want. So essentially, you can tell that just by the parents usually. You know, like, oh. like bitchy child, you know, usually have bitchy parents. Oh, see, everything. I think this can even transcend. It's an epigenetical. Like, yeah, like when a mom dies of exhaustion, they say it's arsenic poisoning as like a joke because really it's the arsenic in the baby that has driven her to her death. Because of the fussiness. Yes, exactly. Well, okay. I mean, you could always just punch a pregnant woman in the stomach, and if she reports it to the police, you know it's probably a, a bitchy, fussy, arsenic child. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jackie, what's the actual answer? How, the how actual are they doing it? The actual answer is you can actually sample developing fetus toenails. Oh. The toenails actually develop in the first trimester. They don't look quite like a toenail when they come out, but you can do sort of an amniocentesis type thing and take a very, very fine sample of toenail, which is actually how they detect arsenic in adult people, in humans. They take a piece of your toenail. But could they not detect it from blood? Why don't they take a blood sample? Why would they go to all the work of taking... It seems like it would be much harder to get that puncture. Because to alter the blood supply and potentially make a puncture of, like, the developing skin, you know, or or arteries or um, veins from the baby is more dangerous. Oh, so does this have a higher survivor rate than yeah. amniocentesis? Okay, because amniocentesis does have a danger associated yeah. with it. Right, right. I mean, this does too. And it has a danger? danger of going into the amniotic sac. Okay. But um, this this is just a way that you can actually take a little tiny piece of baby toenail mm-hmm. and bring it out and test it for arsenic. And the reason they do it is because I think I think right now being validated on not live fetuses and then the idea is that it can become part of a check because they're finding that low levels of arsenic are detrimental to the fetus but it doesn't necessarily transfer you know that if the mother has a certain amount of arsenic the baby has that same amount so to know the amount you have to sort of go in and find out so and it can prevent proper lung development in the baby and then ultimately lead to death well it causes autism that's what the r arsenic is what the r is for an mmr vaccine (laughs) oh okay okay I so I forgot about that. <laughs> I, you know, that one always gets by me. So thank you, Damien. Thank you. Well, this has been a lovely banter. I'm going to give it to Damien. I think that's fair enough. <laughs> Damien wins. Damien wins. Yeah, I'll come in for you. I hope you enjoyed your pity fuck. Okay, guys, come on back to next week's Science Faction, where you'll see Science Faction 28. Don't touch me, Jackie. Possibly without Damien here. Where's your wallet? Give me your wallet. Stay away from me. Put the knife away. Come on back and check us out next week with Science Faction 28. Hope you enjoyed this one, guys. See ya Bobby, next week. Bobby just attached the knife to his penis. I call it my bayonet. <laughs> Ain't no amniocentesis here, bitch. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>